Good afternoon, Young Paul. Good afternoon, my job, so cool. So today is Tuesday, the 27th of September, 2022. Thank you for taking some time to do a Q&A. Today I wanted to uh, ask you to speak on We Bawatanha. Maybe more particularly how a, how a strong, such a strong habit it is in life and generally and relating to our moods, emotions, to ourselves. Yeah, well, we put Danha is Pali word <laughs> that most people don't know. But it's a form of desire, desire to get rid of what you don't like. And so the, uh, it's very important to recognize this in oneself because so much of life and experience is what we don't want. We have thoughts or memories we don't want. And uh, this not wanting something to be the way it is, is a form of suffering that the Buddha pointed out very clearly too. And uh, in, in my own life, for example, being a Buddhist monk, you know, there's a lot you don't want. You, you want to get rid of anger and greed and bad memories and negative moods. And there's so much uh, that, you know, that that we don't like about the world we live in, about our own bodies, about the family we live in, or the society, <laughs> or the world that we believe is our real world. There's so much we don't like about it. And uh, because the, the conditioned realm is about opposites, about heaven and hell, good and bad, right and wrong, true and false, birth and death, and and it's uh, you know we would like to have a world and a life with just filled with peace and happiness, love and kindness and justice, fairness, all the these very positive, beautiful words in the English language is what we want. But our extra experience in daily life is a lot of the negative. So, uh, you know, when you're told that you should be happy and grateful and, and you should respect everybody's rights and human rights and, and how you should be as a person, then when you don't always feel align with such beautiful thoughts or ideals, then you, 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 you try to suppress anger or greed or jealousy or fear, or you try to justify it, you know, about to make personal justifications for and whose fault is, I'm angry now, whose fault is it? And so, um, but the Buddhist investigation is not into the ideals of how things should be, but the way it is. And Wipu and Dhanha, the desire to get rid of, to suppress, to deny, is uh, to be witness to, rather than, I mean, it's not something we get rid of and never experience but it's something we understand as a condition that arises and ceases when the conditions uh, are present for that kind of feeling. Like anger, there's a lot to make one angry in life as a human being, as a man or woman. <clears throat> and so, you know, as an ideal, uh, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be an angry person. 
Uh, that's an ideal, but what I would like to be permanently as a human being with, that's kind and generous and above above these primal emotions. But the human condition is such that anger is a kind of primal emotional part of the package you get from being born in the in the human race on that planet Earth. And uh, to understand it means we begin to witness it, reflect on it, it's like this. And rather than feeling guilty about it or the desire to get rid of it, we don't like it, we, we see it as a teacher because it's there for us to understand that it is a condition that arises according to other conditions. Is it, it might seem personal because we, we, we cling to it, we, a form of clinging and uh, is, is to repress it. So we can be very intellectual about the injustices of the world or past experience by saying, well, nobody's perfect or, you know, we can be generous and, and broad-minded about things and we can try to understand what, why somebody insulted us uh, and, you know, one of, uh, we have a generous nature. We try to say, well, they really couldn't help it, but but uh, no matter how much we rationalize it, wanting to get rid of it, when we're actually feeling it, because it's a feeling, it's a form of desire, and we, we're, we're, our nature is not desire, our true nature is already perfect. So we take the position of the witness, of Whippoor Dunha is like this. And this is the way I found, you know, a kind of wonderful experience in dealing with my own tendencies to blame myself or blame others or, or try to suppress my feelings by rationalizing the situation, trying to be understanding and kind, and at the same time feeling angry and and uh, and unkind, so that the the witness is neither kind nor unkind, but knowing all conditions, all these conditions that arise according to other conditions, are transient, they're impermanent, and we begin to see them not as kind of personal faults identifying with them either through indulging in our anger or trying to suppress it, but being the witness, taking the stand as the witness of the situation that we're experiencing in the present. So, you know, the ideal and then the reality of life is not ideal. So we, when we realize that, then we, we no longer measure every all experience with some ideal we might have in our mind about how things should be or how one would like them to be. And it's not that it's wrong, but it's, it's also a form of attachment that makes us feel guilt-ridden, makes us feel angry, makes us feel frightened, because when we aren't aware of the way life in this realm, this experience of a human form uh, and a sensory uh, and experience is always through senses. They are all sensitive. They're not ideal uh, conditions. So we, this way we develop wisdom as our guide rather than ideals that we can never manifest in our lives. It seems difficult sometimes to notice this not wanting because 
like in the model of the Buddha's teachings, it brings us also back to the first noble truth where what we don't want is suffering. And the right thing with suffering is to learn to allow it to be so we can understand it. So it's not, it's sometimes it's not easy to notice that we're operating from this not wanting or trying to get rid of something. Well, that's where we, we explore it. We deliberately not want things. There's so much in life I don't want. What do you mean deliberately don't want things? Well, like, like you're living in a community of monks and a uh, community of monks and nuns in England. And uh, there's so much you don't, you want everybody to get along and practice. And uh, you don't want disharmony and crises. And so, uh, you know, and, and that's, you know, I can see wanting uh, a group of human beings to get along peacefully and in harmony is not possible on a permanent basis. That each one, each individual in the community is, has their own karma, which is not the same as someone else's. So there's conflict or disagreement or disharmony or, or blame and, and jealousy are all, all parts of human experience whether it's in a monastic community or lay community or in a family, uh, these, you know, we, we would like to have a family where there's just loving kindness and consideration and interest in helping and supporting and being there for each other are, are you know, ideals, good ideals. So when the disharmony comes, you know, then we resist it. So in monastic life, just by observing, deliberately think, bringing into mind how much I don't want, make, bringing it to the surface. And um, it's, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I don't want... Uh, chilies with my food. It's something simple like that. Or I don't want, uh, you know, to have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to go to a morning pujas. Uh, you know, so these are things that one feels you don't want to do, but, um, you know, instead of just ignoring them and saying, well, just get on with life, forget it, and carry on according to the, the Vinaya rules and the, the program of the monastery, you, you examine not wanting to get up at three in the morning is like this. Or feeling guilty about things you've done in the past. You know, so I don't want to feel guilty. And uh, so I just make a statement, I feel guilty about such and such. And, and look at it, and what is aware of feeling guilty? So I'm, I'm not just waiting for things to happen to me, but I can actually explore desire to get rid of things desire for getting things I don't have. Sensual desire. You know, it's, it's, this is a desire realm. And so, you know, when we try to, there's a lot of views about getting rid of desire as some kind of spiritual attainment. But actually, in this realm that we're experiencing through these forms, human forms is, is, a, is a desire realm. And it works through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. Because there's also what is desirable and what is undesirable. And we have 
experience through the senses, through, through the conscious, uh, sensory consciousness, that we tend to, you know, develop a sense of, of uh, a personal separate self. And so when we're, the second noble truth is war. the cause of suffering is attachment, clinging to these three kinds of desires, desires for sense pleasures, desire to become something that you imagine in the future, and a desire to get rid of faults, weaknesses, fear and anger and jealousy and emotions that we personally, you know, on a personal level don't want. Rather than trying to get rid of them, we witness them. They're like this. So that way we can, you know, in the first noble truth about there is suffering is to understand it, not get rid of it. And then the second noble truth is to investigate desire, this clinging. What is clinging to desire? What is suppression of feelings? Oh, you know, what is, is that, you know, you can put it in the, in the English term as clinging, because to try to suppress means you have to try to get rid of something you don't want which creates a sense of separation and, and uh, a personal self that's, that is bound to just helpless in the sensory world of experience through the, through the senses. Where when we take the stand as a witness to the way it is, then we, we, we're no longer caught in that trap. We have a way out, the door to the deathless, is through this awareness of the way things are. Not making everything nice, but in awareness of the way things are, whether, you know, the, the sickness, weakness, fear, cowardliness, jealousies, uh, are part of human in individual experience that we tend to either indulge in or suppress. But rather than indulging or suppressing, we witness they're, they are the way they are. And if we do that, then with patient endurance, they, they cease. And so you, you're using wisdom as your teacher, as your guru, to, to keep you aware of just the human experience in the, in the separate forms that we get, uh, that we suffer from if we don't understand it. We don't understand what it is to feel separate and, and caught in the, in the desire, primal desires of uh, mammalian conditioning. It seems like it's a very, very strong and deep habit that we're in very much accustomed not to notice, not to recognize this kind of habit of not wanting, trying to get rid. Because sometimes, even as a, having heard the Buddhist teachings and trying to put them into practice, we come across suffering, unpleasant states of mind, unpleasant situations. And then we think, I'm going to practice. I'm going to, I'm going to sit down with it and accept it so that it goes away. Yeah, well, that's where we can play games with ourselves, where we, I'm going to practice method to get rid of anger. <laughs> yeah. Or mudita, joy, sympathetic joy, to get rid of jealousy. And, and uh, the, just the idea, I have, I've got to practice to get rid of fear, is a condition we're creating. You know, that I'm somebody that has to get rid of something that I don't like. That means, that, so, you know, I practice in order to become fearless and brave. You know, I'm playing games with myself. I'm caught in the delusions that I really, truly am a separate person. And this body is 
my body and my feelings and my thoughts and my memories and my emotions. Everything's mine, me and mine. And, you know, I encourage people to listen to that. To listen to this sense of me. What about me? And uh, do you care about me? Or who cares about me? And my life, and I want to live my life. I don't want to become a puppet in a puppet show. I want to express myself and my individuality. You hear it all the time on the media, you know, about how important uh, uh, this sense of me and expressing myself, my rights, my views, my opinions, and by exploring that. So I listen. I've learned to listen to this sense of me and mine. And that which is aware, when you intentionally listen to the me and mine programming, that which is aware of me and mine isn't me, isn't mine. It's not a condition that that I can claim it with words as my mindfulness, my practice, my meditation, my belief, and on and on like that. You begin to see it as merely artificial conditions created through education, through cultural uh, conditioning, through programming. What is brainwashing? When we talk about brainwashing, where you, you, you can convince somebody that they really are what you want them to believe in, you know. So you, you know, there's all kinds of interesting write-ups about brainwashing and how it's used through, through fear, through repetition through conditioning. But one thing that isn't conditioned is awareness. It's not culture, it's not male or female, it's not, you know, it's not personal. And you begin to trust, and the more you trust awareness, not judging the conditions that do arise, just observing them is a way of letting go of them, breaking the habit, the, the ingrained habits we've, we've formed since we were born. This listening position, it really does imply that you recognize awareness or consciousness, because it's the refuge. You can't be aware of consciousness because you are conscious. That you can be aware of conditions. But you know how sometimes in the practice there's this kind of, you, you remember hearing, just be aware of it, it comes and goes. And as a thought it's correct, but you can't really watch it and be awareness, aware of its impermanence unless you come back to awareness itself. Like, awareness is, isn't personal. So, you, you know, that's where it is the, the way to deal with the personal stuff. You know, the, the witness position is not taking a personal position. We, you know, personally, we take a, if we're witnessing as a judge, you know, so I'm judging what I'm thinking is right and wrong, good and bad, or false. And uh, and so I have these adjectives or definitions for feelings and for what I see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think. And so that's 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 the personal conditioning we've received. That's the ego. That's the cultural programming, the religious programming that we've received on the conventional level. And it's, it tends, it tends, it's always judgmental about what's right, what's proper, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, 
what's true, what's false, and and that's the that's conditioned thinking. Thinking is conditioned. But what isn't conditioned is conscious awareness. So you can't you can't witness conscious awareness because you are that. That's your ultimate that's ultimate reality. And that's the when we realize that, that's the end of suffering. We doesn't mean that we don't experience, you know, through the forms, the physical forms, old age sickness and death and what we call vipaka karma, karma from the past, old memories arise and and uh, people can, you know, criticize us or blame us for things we haven't done and, and the world spins around in, in the same way. But the difference is that we're the conscious awareness of the world is, is a condition arising and ceasing rather than the real, quote, the real world, unquote. So the, the real world that we condition to believe in is not real, it's not reality. And what is real in every human being is consciousness, conscious awareness. And it's pure, it's not, it's not programmed or judgmental by anything. It has, and you can't objectify it because you are that. It's like trying to see your own eyes. You can't do it because the eyes are function for seeing and they can't see themselves. And consciousness, you can't find it but because you are that. And that's wisdom to realize that that this is if I have to have an identity is with consciousness rather than with the ego, the political viewpoints, religious biases that are or idealism that you know no matter how brilliant my mind my intellect might be, it's still conditioned, it's acquired knowledge. It is, uh, its very nature is impermanent to arise and cease. But what doesn't arise and cease is conscious, consciousness. We, you know, the ignorant human being isn't aware of that. He identifies everything in a very personal way. So all conscious experience is judged according to how they're programmed by society. Like recently in the news in Iran, a woman was persecuted for not wearing a headscarf or some, something like this. And uh, then, you know, then the conditions make that a, a, a criminal offense, not wearing a woman, not wearing a headscarf. And in America, women aren't, we don't have that kind of conditioning. So we tend to judge Iranian culture by American standards, and then we, we don't get the point at all. And we can't really help where we're born, in what country, how we're conditioned with, with very right-wing parents or very liberal left-wing parents or as Christians or Buddhists or Muslims. You know, do we choose that in any intentional way or is that just, we can say it's our karma? You know, but even that sounds too personal. But karma isn't about justifying personal identities, but it's a convenient way of explaining the, the, the experience we have through the senses and how we interpret that experience. So a woman without a headscarf in America, you know, nobody thinks twice about it. <laughs> so, and, because we're not conditioned to see it as wrong or bad in any way. And we, we have ideas of, 
of uh, freedom and justice and human rights, equality, you know, so this, um, where in a, in a different culture, they can be very conditioned to believe in, in the opposite ways. It's conditioning. It's not personal anymore. But it is uh, why the world is the way it is, why Ukrainians and Russians identify with these, with the land that they live on. You know, where does Ukraine really belong? In Russia or as an independent country? And so <laughs> then we take sides. You know, being a, Americans, we tend to take sides with Ukraine. But, but uh, does the land really belong to anybody? Does America belong to, you know, to the white race? Or is it, is it the property of the Native Americans? You know, you can, you can argue these points and be a, make everyone kind of interested in and uh, question life through the intellect. But to be free from that kind of doubt, questioning, and side-taking is to, to, to trust in awareness of our own opinions and views, no matter how righteous or wrong they might be. They are what they are. They arise, they cease. And even wrong views arise and cease, just like right views. So in this way, we're, we're transcending the dualistic world that we are conditioned by to realize the oneness, the perfection that we really are is this conscious awareness. Thank you, Lombard.